Just when we thought the door on Benghazi Gate might be closing, it seems today to have swung right back open following a meeting with acting CIA Director Michael Morell and U.N. Ambassador Susan Rice, who has become the focal point of the controversy for adherence to inaccurate intelligence talking points. Her most vocal critics in the GOP emerged with their talking points unified and intact. We are significantly troubled by many of the answers that we got and some that we didn't get. I'm more troubled today uh, knowing having met with the acting director of the CIA and Ambassador Rice. Bottom line, I'm more disturbed now than I was before. For her part, Ambassador Rice released a statement shortly after the meeting reiterating her defense. And I quote, we stressed that neither I nor anyone else in the administration intended to mislead the American people at any stage in this process. And the administration updated Congress and the American people as our assessments evolved. Joining us now is ABC News Chief White House correspondent Jake Tapper, who is the author of the much lauded new book, The Outpost. Jake, we'll get to your book in a second. But first, I want to ask you about Benghazi Gate. Honestly, I don't quite understand what the senators continue to be upset about. She's acknowledged, Susan Rice has acknowledged, that her statements were wrong but were based upon the best intelligence at the moment. Is there any reason not to believe that statement on her part? Well, one of the things that Senator Graham said today was that he wants more of the investigation, uh, the, the information to come out. For, uh, uh, the FBI agents who have interviewed uh, survivors of the attack and he wants to know more information before he says he would be willing to elevate somebody who was involved uh, in any part of uh, this controversy. I, I do think that Susan Rice is not really uh, the one that I am personally most concerned about, just as a reporter trying to find out the truth. I'm the State Department itself and Susan Rice is part of it but not really in part, uh, involved in uh, deciding why they didn't get adequate security, uh, who did what in terms of uh, trying to help the people who were pinned down. Uh, that, that seems to be more of a CIA question. Those are the people I really want to find out more about. Look, I, I think that's exactly right. There are a myriad of legitimate questions that should be asked about the information flow, the security decision making, but it seems to me Susan Rice is the least informed, least interesting party here, and that's why trying to take her hostage in effect at the moment where they met, she might be elevated Secretary of State suggests a larger political agenda. And again, I don't want to impute to, to Senator McCain or Lindsey Graham, but is there an element of just tweaking the president here? Well, there always is, whatever party's doing it. But one of the things that sounded inter interesting uh, from Senator Ayad is that she seemed, at least based on her comments, she seemed more concerned about what she heard from the acting CIA director, Mike Morrell, right. uh, than what I mean, she, na she named him first. And, and Susan Rice was almost an afterthought. I wonder if that was what was disturbing uh, to Senator Ayotte or any of the other senators. Well, frankly, that might be more legitimate. Although the CIA, if you listen to David Petraeus, says, we knew that this was not a spontaneous re revolt or spontaneous yeah. uh, eruption, and therefore we somehow our information got filtered. Look, th this will continue for some period of time. Let's switch gears a little bit to what's going on in Egypt, which seems to be sort of gripping us in an international level. You know, Morsi, Mohammed Morsi, on one day as a hero, he's brokered a deal. The second day, he's under assault by the very people in the street who brought him and swept him into power. How do you assess what's going on there and our capacity to sort of nudge him towards maintaining a democratic framework? Well, the nudging is being done by all sorts of members of the International Monetary Fund and individuals saying to Egypt, if you want money for your country to thrive, uh, you're going to have to backtrack a little. And I think that that message was delivered. One of the interesting uh, dynamics going on here is that as uh, difficult as Morsi's actions the other day were to, to swallow for those of us who actually live in a democracy, uh, the judiciary there is really not blameless either. Uh, they dissolved uh, one of the houses mm -hmm. of parliament there. There's a threat that they might do it uh, to the other house of parliament and, and uh, to the other legislative body. Uh, so I, I do think that uh, Morsi might be, his power grab might be unseemly and undemocratic, but there is also something nefarious going on uh, by the other branch. Look, his power grab was terribly calibrated misjudged. Look, there was a school of thought that he had a lot of international goodwill. He thought he could get away with it domestically. The folks in the street said not so fast. But you're right. The judiciary is a holdover from the Mubarak era. Right. And they had been pushing back against some of the legitimate things he wanted to do, such as crafting a constitution. And so there is a more delicate balance here than perhaps has been obvious from the front. But who are the folks in the street? Is it the more secular 
piece of the populace and, and is, the, is the Muslim Brotherhood still behind him or is the Muslim Brotherhood also saying, hey, <laughs> Mohammed Marsi, you've gone too far? I, I think that from what I understand, the Muslim Brotherhood is behind him. I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood is, is, a, is a, a largely religious organization in a lot of ways that believes in a, in a, a theocratic uh, rule. Um, I, I think the issue is a lot of the young, young people and the democratic reformers who are marching in the street, uh, they weren't as organized, and that's why uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, which was very organized, was able to uh, grab the reins of power. I, I, I think that there is a, a real, uh, there always has been a chasm between these two groups, and that's going to continue. Right. And interestingly, if you go back several years when Tahrir Square was occupied initially, it was the more secular groups, and the Muslim Brotherhood wasn't there initially. Right. So, an interesting dynamic, not quite a replay. Switching gears again, let's go to Afghanistan. Of course, the topic of, of really, your, your book has gotten rave reviews. It uses this one outpost and this one battle as a metaphor for the entire war. Right. As you look Look forward to 2014. Should we have 10,000 troops there? The number being bandied about now. Can they serve a purpose? I, I think, without question, the troops uh, that are going to be there after the combat troops withdraw. Mm -hmm. Everybody talked. The Obama administration, when they were running for re-election, talked about Joe Biden, Vice President Biden, said, "You know, that we'll, we're going to leave in 2014. That's the end of it. It's not the end of it. It's not really true. Right. There will be a counter-terrorist force." Uh, and there's a, actually a, a lieutenant uh, in my book who was there at this one outpost as a regular combat soldier and is, and is now a special forces soldier. Uh, and he is very optimistic and thinks that uh, the, the work done at that outpost, he's in the minority, but the work done uh, is positive and is affecting change. Um, I, I think it, answer, in what way? You know, as, as one who's been a skeptic of what right. we could succeed through just brute military strength in, in, in a region where the Taliban and, and Al-Qaeda, maybe we've decapitated Al-Qaeda, but the Taliban seems enmeshed and woven into the fabric of the society. What have we accomplished? Well, okay, so the, the, the book traces this one outpost from 2006 until 2009 when it was overrun by the Taliban. In 2007, 2008, that's a, that's a part, in the, part of the narrative uh, when there actually is very tangible achievement, mm -hmm. uh, and the U.S. and the Afghan government is able to win over the local populace right. and get them to start casting out the terrorists in the villages and hamlets. Um, and this one lieutenant, Alex Newsom, who was in Afghanistan earlier this year doing special operations uh, missions, says that when he went back to this area, um, the people there all remembered him. They were still anti-Taliban. Mm -hmm. uh, they were still willing to fight, and he was very encouraged. As I said, he is in the minority there, but it wasn't as if uh, all these individuals all of a sudden became Taliban. Mainly, they just don't want anyone bothering them. Right. I mean, that's the question. No doubt our presence there can have that affirmative effect. Was it possible, is it possible to argue that there would have been a pushback that would, might have been even stronger against the Taliban without an external force where we become, in a way, the, 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 the enemy, we become the invading presence, we become the empire that Af Afghan people have rejected for thousands of years. Yeah, I don't know. And, and I mean, the, what the book illustrates is uh, this counterinsurgency, which is trying to win over yeah. the local population, get them to embrace economic development, yeah. tie them to the Afghan yeah. government. Uh, it can work, yeah. but it's very, very fragile yeah. and very, very difficult to do. Uh, and so when it does happen, uh, it all there's a catastrophic event, and I'm right. not going to spoil the book for you, right. but there's a catastrophic event uh, that makes it all go to hell, uh, right. and then within a well, year, they're overrun. Full confession, haven't yet read it, but I will. Everybody says it's amazing. Congratulations, spectacular Thank book. Thank you. I'm going to throw one last question at sure. it. You can dodge it if you want. Susan Rice, Secretary of State, yes or no? I think it's possible that I, I think she'll get 51 yeah. votes. I mean, yeah. I, and, and she'll I, be nominated. I, I think she'll be nominated, and right. I think she'll get the votes, yes. All right, thank you. ABC News Chief, White House correspondent and author of The Outpost, Jake Tapper, thank you so much for your time Thank tonight. you.